verses 21 through 24. It says, Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me. When I was in a besieged city, I, I had said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight, but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who, does, who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. Let's remain standing and sing our new song of the month, Praise His Name. It comes from Psalm 148. Reaches of heaven, starry heights, the lights of the evening, dancing in silent skies, brilliance of morning, breaking. Yeah. 
had no ears to hear your voice, did not know your love within, had no taste for heaven's joys. Then your spirit gave me life, opened up your word to me, through the before then to put us together. Lord, we praise you this morning for the answers to prayer that we've seen so much in this church. And Lord, um, we thank you that we are able as your children to come uh, without fear to your, to your throne, without worry to your throne, without anxiety that you will not listen. Lord, for your children who have been changed, just as we learned in Sunday school this morning, we are new creatures. We are new men and women, boys and girls, uh, created in the image of Christ and transformed who have an ability to approach you. And Lord, I, I, my prayer is that we'll be a church of prayer, that we will be a people of prayer, that in our, in our own private lives, in our families, as couples, as, uh, uh, when we come together as a corporate gathering, that we would be focused on prayer because this is how you move. And Lord, we just uh, we praise you and thank you for uh, the privilege we have to do that. Lord, there are so many things we could lift to you today. Lord, I, my heart's heavy for uh, a West Virginia trooper who lost his life here just a couple days ago in the line of duty. Lord, and uh, just lift up, up his family, his friends, his colleagues as they grieve his loss. Lord, we, we lift up all the people, our first responders, our, our, our military, the other people that we take for granted so much that keep us safe, who serve us, who are willing to give that sacrifice. Lord, we lift them up to you. We lift our families to you who suffer in ways that we don't know because we're not there doing that unless we're part of it. And Lord, we just uh, ask your, a special grace and a blessing for them. Lord, we lift up our nation to you, and Lord, such confusion, uh, such a loss of vision, a loss of purpose at times, it seems. Lord, uh, we lift up our leaders to you, some that we may not agree with, some that we do, 
many that we are frustrated with. But Lord, we know that our answers do not lie in the works of man, in the wisdom of man, in the things of this world. Lord, our hope lies in you. Lord, help us not to be discouraged and to be, be overwhelmed by our thoughts on these matters. Be concerned, yes. Act when, when you call us to, yes. Pray always, yes. But Lord, to let us be focused on our daily lives with our family, with our workplace, our schools, our interactions with each other in our community. Lord, that is where our hope lies. When we live the life that exudes the image of our creator to the people around us. Lord, that we love our neighbors, that we uh, give of ourselves in the true definition of what that love means, to die to ourselves daily. Lord, that is our hope. Our hope is in you because you've transformed us to be that being. And God, give us the power to do that. Lord, I lift up our church to you. Continue to guide us and direct us in our teaching and our preaching. Lord, in our interactions with each other. Lord, help us to act on these principles of forgiveness that we've learned over the last several weeks. Lord, help us as we delve into the concepts of marriage in our Sunday school in the next several weeks to come, that we would understand that this, this affects all of us, whether we're married or not. Lord, draw us together as only you can. We praise you and we thank you for all these things. In your holy and precious name, amen. This morning, we are going to the book of Jude, go all the way to the end of your Bible, the very last book in your Bible is Revelation. Right before that, you'll find the book of Jude, which is 25 verses. We started two weeks ago with a, with a, with a great overview from a guest preacher. Brother Rod Wilton, last week we took those first four verses, kind of broke them down. This week, I'm going to attempt to go through probably the most challenging, difficult part of the book. Um, all of the examples that he gives of the false teachers that he's warning about. And uh, why does he give these specific examples? And I'm going to take a guess at that, take an aim at that. Um, so... Uh, we pray that uh, God would guard my tongue from saying anything that, that he doesn't want to have said and that you will look, will, will look closely at the word of God here. So let's read it. We're going uh, to read verses 4 through 19 this morning. Would you stand? And we're diving in right where he addresses why he wrote the letter to this group of people, this church. It says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people, these people, referring back to the false teachers, also relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people 
blaspheme all they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with tens, ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. We'll stop there. Father, would you please give us and give myself understanding Would you please help me to tremble over this text in my spirit? Would you please help me, O God, to rightly divide the word of truth this morning? Would you help us to see and to hear this warning that Jude gives, not only to these readers, but we read it here this morning as a warning to us of ungodly people who have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of it. Oh, Lord, give us ears to hear. Take control of this group of people this morning that we would listen and hear your voice. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The title of the message this morning is Warned. And unfortunately, this is not a feel-good sermon. Unfortunately, this is a sermon about the judgment of God upon false teachers in the church, those who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny the master, the Lord Jesus Christ. They deny the lordship, the authority of Jesus Christ. That's who this is about. Um. So just as way of background, and last week, you can go back on the internet and listen to the sermon. I took the first four verses, and Jude starts out in a positional way, in a way that that is, is very encouraging. But then he warns. He warns that we must contend for the faith. Look at verse three there. We didn't read it this morning, but jump back up there and look at it for a minute. I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend to fight, to agonize over the truth, the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Let's just take that verse for a minute. I'll do a little recap. First of all, we see that faith is fixed. There is the faith. There are not multiple faiths. There is the faith, the one true faith. We would call it the gospel. The faith that is fixed, the faith that was a body of belief, even in Jude's day. Isn't this amazing? That he points to something with authority that they can look back on, that that is objective, that they can look at, even in Jude's day. It's the fixed faith, a specific, agreed-on, common body of truth concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's what we would call orthodox. 
Now, we don't like the word orthodox because it's been kind of abused. The Berrios went to um, Israel, and we see, we see I, you expressed it this morning, but I saw the same thing, grieved in my heart at all these shrines. Like, if you go, if you go to the place where they think was close to where maybe the baby Jesus lay, it's, it's horrendous. You walk through this cavernous thing with all, these, all this garb, and you go to this one little hole that looks like a, chip, a fireplace, and you see this, this candle burning over this thing. It's, it, that's what we think of when we think of orthodoxy. But, but orthodoxy is not a bad word. The word I'm meaning is it's what's been commonly agreed on, handed down from, from one generation to the next, the truth concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And back in Jude's day, Maybe what we read this morning, a lot of it hadn't even been written yet or hadn't been circulated thoroughly yet, but it was, it was understood. It was agreed on. It had been read and passed down, and they got word of it, and, and what they had was good. So faith is fixed. It's fixed here. Jude says it. In his day, there was a fixed faith. There was objective truth that had been figured out so that he could make a statement like this. We see faith is fixed. We also see it, it's delivered. Now, why is that important? Because it's, it's not discovered, it's delivered. God, God gave it to us. It wasn't figured out by man's intellect or reason. It wasn't that we were seeking God and we figured it out. It's that we weren't seeking God, but He delivered it to us. He dropped it right before us. It's delivered. The truth was given the truth was revealed to us because God, who is truth, delivered it. We didn't think it up. We aren't at liberty then to change it because it was delivered to us. It was given to us by God himself. And notice the other thing it says there. It was once for all. Once for all. Now, that's an interesting statement that Jude makes in his day because even at that point, I think what he's saying there is not to be added to. Everything Jude had in his, his day, we have here this morning. Nothing else is needed. The Bible, truth, this body of truth we call the Scriptures is sufficient. Nothing else is divine. Nothing else is authoritative, or maybe I should say divinely inspired. We have the faith. We have this body of truth. The Bible, it was given once and for all. And we have it here this morning. And that's where all of the cults and all of the false religions of the world mess this up. They say we need an extra book, a book of Mormon. They see, say we need the Quran. They say we need the Catholic ex cathedra or something else, that it wasn't enough. Jude says it was. In his day, it's finished, it's written. We have everything we need. We have, it's sufficient, the scriptures. And if we, if we veer off of that, then we get into the error that, that he's going to address here in the book of Jude. We don't have to worry about where to find the faith once for all because God has preserved it for us and you all have copies laying in your laps this morning or on your phones or wherever you have it. We've put it on the screens we come here, the church is to be about opening this book and reading what God says and discerning by context and, and original languages and all those kinds of things, discerning what he means by what he says. And we can't even do that without the Spirit in us, giving us understanding to do that. So it's, it's once for all delivered to the saints Faith is fixed, faith is delivered, faith is once for all. Jude had it, we have it, we have the same things that Jude is saying here. We have Jude's letter here this morning. And it was delivered to the saints because the saints are the only ones that really can receive it. What do I mean by that? 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person does not receive or accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are only spiritually discerned. So he hands the faith down to the saints and he, and he hands the, the fact that we need to contend for it because we're the only ones that understand we have to contend for it. The world isn't contending for it. 
The world's making up their own ideas to go against it. And so it's written to us. Saints are, are the only ones that contend for the faith. And that's why he starts out, saints. He doesn't use the word saints, but he says those who are what? Called, those who are beloved, and those who are kept. Those would be saints. Saints. We are to contend for the faith. Paul says a similar thing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.20. He says, oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and the contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved or drifted from the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, I added that part in there because that's in Jude, but I think that's what Paul meant when he writes to Timothy. You say, okay, pastor, I get it. Quit, quit hammering this point away. You know, we, we heard this in Sunday school too. I mean, maybe God's trying to speak to someone here today that's kind of wondering, you know. I get it. What does this have to do with me? Why do you keep hammering this away? I believe the Bible. I'm not perverting God's grace. Well, let, let me remind you that Jude's, letters, Jude's letter here is written, I don't think so much to the false teachers as to those who are having to go against the false teachers to contend for this. So there is a possibility. And, and, and many of Paul's writings are like this. Peter's writings are like this, where he warns us, brothers and sisters, don't, don't drift about by all the vain philosophies of this world, but hold fast, contend to the faith. You say, what's well, not possible? Well, let me give you a little history lesson real quick. It's a side note. I'm going to try to get through this quick, but it's just too good to pass up. If you've got a Bible, turn to Acts 20, 28 for a minute. I'm going to show you one particular church who we, we would all admire. We would admire this church as we hear about it in Scripture. But they drifted away in some regard, not totally away, but drifted away from the truth they once knew, from the love of Jesus Christ that they once knew. Look at this, Acts 20, 28. Let me set it up. We're not reading the whole context of it, so we're jumping in the middle of something. Paul here is on his missionary journeys, and he's headed back to the, to the shores of Ephesus. He doesn't want to go to Ephesus again at that point because... It didn't go well for him the last time he was there. So he meets the Ephesian, but a church was planted, and, and the Ephesian elders meet him on the coast of Mylita here, I think it is. And, and he says, pay careful attention. In verse 28, pay careful attention. He says this to the elders of this church. Pay careful attention to yourselves. Now, these are the godly leaders of the church. Why would Paul gather them and tell them, to pay careful attention to yourselves because we're living in sin, these bodies of sin, right? And even pastors. How many of you have heard about pastors falling from the faith? You know, renouncing the faith that they once preached so heartily about. If it can happen to pastors, it can happen to any of us. So Paul says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know, listen to this, after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, among you. You won't know that they're fierce wolves until they're there a while, and it'll begin to unravel. They'll come in among you, not sparing the flock. They're going to deceive. And they're going to go straight for anyone they can get to follow after them, not sparing the flock, and from among, among your own selves, from among what, 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 was, what was looked at as the church, in the church, within the church, there are people that aren't really the church. And they're, they're, they're going to come from among your own selves. They'll arise and they'll speak twisted things to draw you away, the disciples after them. They would rather you follow them and you worship them and look at them as they, they know, oh, look at, the, look at the depth of knowledge that they have. And, and, it, and it's really drawing, drawing you away from Jesus and on, on to them. Now, that's what Paul tells these Ephesian elders about. One of the strongest churches, I think, if we read the book of Ephesians and, we, and, we, and Timothy was there and as a pastor at one point, and 
we would say that it's probably one of the best examples of a New Testament church that we'd want to pattern ourselves after. But then you go to Revelation. If you want to go there, you can. It's just right after Jude, chapter 2. I'm going to read you the first four verses. So Paul gives a warning to the Ephesian elders. Now John is writing, and Jesus is speaking. This is Jesus speaking. John is recording what Jesus spoke. Revelation 2, 1 through 4, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works. Jesus is saying to this church, I know your works. I know your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary, but I have something against you. You have abandoned, abandoned the love that you had at first. Now that's interesting because if you read in, in the opening chapter of Ephesians, Paul points out that they are a loving church. Look at this, Ephesians 1.15. If you want to turn back there. If not, it's Ephesians 1.15. I'm going to read it real quick, just this verse. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith, Paul says to the Ephesian church, the Ephesian elders, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and I've heard of your love toward all the, toward all the saints. Yet the Ephesian church gets rebuked for not loving by Jesus himself in the book of Revelation. So what do you do all about that? The point I'm trying to make here is you can hear the book of Jude and you can say, this doesn't apply to me, this doesn't apply to our church, and it does. That we can fall prey to the deception of false teachers. Now, if you're his, you're his. He's going to say that at the end. But he's warning don't be led astray. Don't let your church be, and that's what's happening, you know, that losing its effectiveness, its witness in this dark world we live in. It's like a city on a hill with a light being put under a bushel that has no effectiveness. Because if you go back to Revelation and you continued reading, so he, here, here's the solution to this. Jesus tells the church in Ephesus, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. And repent. Turn back to your first love. Turn back to loving Jesus. Turn back to loving the saints. Continue standing on sound doctrine. But it, 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 really, it really encapsulates all of this. And he goes on to say in the, in, the, in the last verse 7, to the one who conquers, the one who contends, you can plug that word in there, that's the word Jude is using, the one who contends or conquers or perseveres, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. Now, again, that's important because Ephesians, where he commends them for their love, was written in around A.D. 60, and Revelation was written probably in A.D. 90, so it took about 30 years for the Ephesian church to be commended for something good that God was doing to get a complete rebuke by Jesus Christ for something they weren't doing. 30 years. That's just a couple of generations. That's how fast the church can lose its effectiveness if we drift away from the Word of God and, 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 and buy into all these philosophical things that are in our world today. And that's exactly what was happening in the book of Jude. They were coming and looking like they were people of Jesus Christ, the church, saved. But they were taking God's grace that saved them because it wasn't on any account of their own. It wasn't by their works. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith, and that not even of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of your works, not of the things you do or don't do. It's mere grace that saved you here today. But don't take that grace and use it as a license for promiscuity, for sensuality, for, for all, these, all these words that are translated differently in some, in, in some 
translations of the Bible, but meaning the same thing, this looseness that I can do anything I want because I'm saved by grace. And that is Jude's concern. So the point of today's text is he gives a warning, a very, very uh, descriptive warning. Like how many times, I went through and underlined him, how many times is the word ungodly or ungodliness used? It's almost like, is this guy for real? Like you, you work with people who use expletives and, you, and you're amazed at how they can use expletives in sentences. I've met people like that. It's like, and then I say, and they'll say, and, and what do you do? I'm a pastor. Oh, well, excuse my language, you know, or something like that. <laughs> well, it's, it's like that with, with Jude here. How many times and in how many ways? Okay, we get the point here. These people, he, these people are in the church. People in the church are beginning to follow after them. They're perverting grace, and he gives them judgment. So, Here's the point of this whole section we just read. God will judge the ungodly. This is serious business. These certain people or those people were long ago designated for condemnation. In other words, there is a certain judgment coming against people, these people who pervert the grace of God. They are false teachers. They are grace perverters. They are those who deny and reject the lordship of Christ and have a certain destiny for doing it, and their destiny is judgment, condemnation, destruction, eternal fire. Those are all words used in this text. So don't doze on me today, because he's talking to church people here, and he's warning them to contend for the faith and don't be caught up in this. Stand on the faith that is fixed once for all to all the saints, the Word of God. Don't drift from it. Don't let all this extra biblical stuff come in. You know, all these writings on the New York bestsellers list and all those things. Some of them have some truth only in as much as they are quoting Scripture and rightly dividing Scripture. So, so, you know, I'm not saying all books are bad. I'm just saying there's a lot of things that drift way off of that. And we have to be careful. So from the text, I'm going to give you three things. I, there's a good possibility. I'm not going to get through all this today. So for those of you that get annoyed with not filling in the blanks, here, are, here, they, here they are. You're going to get the three cases, or maybe a better word is examples. He's going to give you three examples from the history of Scripture on how people perverted God's grace. And then there are three characteristics. So he's going to give us some other examples where, there, where characteristics are drawn out. And then there are three cautions. Or maybe a better word would be warnings, but I'm trying to stick with C words here. So, so you'll remember it. There's, there's uh, cases, characteristics, and cautions. So let's go for the first one here. The three cases. First one is this, in verses 5 through 7. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, this isn't going to be new stuff. You know this stuff. You've been led astray into different areas, so go back to what you already know. Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? How many of you, if you were telling the story of Moses, would use, would use the truth that Jesus led them through, through the Red Sea? We probably wouldn't say that, would we? We'd probably say God, which is a fact of his the triune God and his deity here. Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of, of Egypt, afterward, afterward, destroyed those who did not believe. Can you imagine being led out of Egypt and all the miraculous wonders, the power of Almighty God on earth doing all these miraculous things that have never been done again? You saw it with your own eyes. You actually had your family as you walked through the, the Red Sea on dry ground. And you looked back and you saw that you were being hunted down by Egyptian so soldiers. And the waters came crashing in on you. You saw it with your own eyes. You had your kids by the hand. 
as you were, as you were crying and walking, I'm getting real descriptive and I'm going extra biblical on you here, but I'm just, paint this picture in your mind. Afterward, destroyed those who didn't believe. So much for, if you do a miracle, I'll believe in you, God. And the angels who did not stay within their own positions of, the, of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept an eternal Chartness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires. They serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. In other words, God judged all three of these cases. So why do you think that if you're anything like them, you're in unbelief, you're in rebellion, and you're in immorality, that he won't judge you? That's the question that Jude poses. So there are three things here. There's unbelieving Israel in verse 5. There's rebellious angels in verse 6. And there's the immorality of Sodom and Gomorrah doing what they wanted, doing what made them feel good in verse 7. And the point is, God will judge those unbelieving, rebellious, immoral people even now, just as he has done it in the past. He will do it again. He will do it again. And you're sitting there breathing, and you say, well, he hasn't done it yet. Maybe that's what you're thinking. He will do it again. So let's take unbelieving Israel. What's he referring to here? I want, you, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus saved a people out of the land of Egypt, but afterward, here's this word, destroyed those who did not believe. Now, you can read about Jude's example here of unbelieving Israel. He's probably referring back to Exodus 8 and 9 or Numbers, chapters 11, maybe chapter 14, chapter 16, where, where it mentions Korah's rebellion. Or you could read Hebrews 3. But we don't have time this morning to read all those. Those are all how they saw the wonders of God, but they, they, they were in unbelief. They still disbelieve God, and they grumbled and murmured and complained. And if, well, if God's real, then why won't he feed us real food? We've been eating this angel food for you know, how, however long. So if you want the Cliff Notes version of this, you can pick it up in Psalm 78. Let me just read a little bit of it to you. Psalm 78, 12. It begins in at 12. And, and it's just a history. It's a recap. Listen to it. In the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them pass through it he made the water stand up like a heap. That's the parting of the Red Sea. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud and all night with a fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of a rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God saying, can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the rock so that water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also give bread or provide meat for his people? Therefore, when the Lord heard, he was full of wrath and a fire was kindled against Jacob or the people of Israel. We know them as later. His anger rose against Israel because they did not believe in God and did not trust His saving power. After all that, it goes on. Yet He commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven and He rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Man ate of the bread of angels and He sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens and by His power... He let out the south wind and he rained meat on them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas. They complained about the bread, so he gave them some meat here. He let them fall in the midst of their camp, all around their dwellings, and they ate and were filled, for he gave them what they craved. But before they had satisfied their craving, while the food was still in their mouths, the anger of the God, God rose against them, and he killed the strongest of them 
and laid low the young men of Israel, in spite of all this, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. So he made their days vanish like a breath and their years in terror. When he killed them, they sought him. They repented and sought God earnestly. They remembered that God was their rock, the most high God, their redeemer. But they flattened him, or I'm sorry, they flattered him with their mouths. They lied to him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast toward him. They were not faithful to his covenant. That's the Cliff Notes version of a recap of several times throughout Israel's history when God displayed his glorious works, his glorious works, and they did not believe, and he destroyed them. And that's Jude's first example. So how can you look at the marvelous, matchless grace of God? How can you really see, redeemed people, of the mercy that he has bestowed on you and grumble against him and say, God, if you're really real, why do you do Now, we think these things in our hearts, don't we? But we've got to take every thought captive and bring it back into subjection to the word of God. That's what the psalmist does. That's what Job does. I mean, he's thinking these things like, why me? But then quickly, when we read the whole of the book and the whole of the text of Scripture, these people bring their thoughts and their, their thinking back into subjection to the Word of God. What is the truth? Not what am I feeling right now. What is the truth? That's the first. The second one is rebellious angels. Verse 6, look at it. And the angels who did not stay within their position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept, there's that word kept, he likes that word in Jude, kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Now, I think that kept in chains is figurative. I think there are demons who are not in chains right now who are, who are working this planet. What it means by kept in chains is he, they are all still under his jurisdiction. We get that from Job. They can't do a thing where he does not allow it. So they're kept in chains till one day there's going to be a judgment on them. So I think he uses this illustration of rebellious angels to show that those who rebel and cross boundaries that God has put in place are in danger of judgment. Now, now the, the, I don't think Jude is writing in a spirit of condemnation. Yeah, like I haven't, but you guys have, and you need to straighten up. I don't think he's like that. I think it's consternation. Or the word consternation means concern. He's deeply concerned that people in the church are listening to this kind of error and are being led astray, and it's, it's burdening his heart. Therefore, you've got to contend. You've got to keep looking back at the faith that was fixed, the faith that was given once for all to the saints. Quit looking at all this new stuff that people are saying, new revelation and new this and new ideas and God spoke to me and God gave me this dream and God did this and God, you know, and, and, and if it doesn't line up with what has already been given in this body of truth that Jude had in his day and we have today, then you are in danger of rebelling and going outside of what God has said. And, and this is what God did to angels. Their, their doom and their destiny is gloomy darkness. And there's going to be a judgment, a horrible judgment on that. One, one, one translation of the scripture, instead of great day, that, that horrible day where God's holiness will shine so brightly that everything sinful in its path will be judged. So Jude has the spirit of concern on this church and you might ask, well, who are, these, who are these angels? What's he referring to? And I, and I would say my first answer would be really any angels that rebel against God's authority. Angels who de don't stay in the place that God assigned them to. God's, God's position, God's position of authority. Alistair Begg writes these words. This opens up all kinds of cans of worms for people. Now we get to, this is where extra biblical stuff comes in, right? We get to interject have you, have you, have you, is this just me, or, or do, I, do I run into people all the time with weird, weird ideas about angels? Like weird stuff. 
Like, I don't even know where it's coming from. And you'll most, you'll most frequently hear this at funerals, right? Well, God needed another angel. First of all, you guys aren't going to be made into angels when you die. There's nothing in the Bible about that. That's, that's not true. That's not, but all kind of, we love the fascination with angels, right? And they all look like beautiful women. Or babies, little cherubs, little cute fat babies, you know, with a diaper hanging off of them and little wings that you're, you're wondering when you look at the picture, how do those wings support that thing? So, so he says, it opens up all kinds of cans of worms. This is Alistair Begg again. People's imaginations go off here. Jude's original recipients would have gotten the point a whole lot quicker than us. Why? Because they understood the common stories and the contemporary writings in the cultural Jewish tradition. Like, for instance, the book of Enoch, which he gets into later and which I'll address later. So hold on to that one. We might not get to that today, but Jude quotes common sources that would be known in that day. I will say this, just to kind of disarm your worrying about this until I get to unpack it a little more. Again, I'm going to refer to the burials because they were just recently in, in the Holy Land, Israel, Jerusalem. You guys were in Greece. And, and one of the first stories that Scott shared with us this morning is standing on Mars Hill. I had the same experience. I wept for like 10 minutes as I read that text and saw the backdrop. And, and I said, whoa, man. This guy was filled with the power of God to be able to stand with all of these poets and all of these supposedly wise people. Paul used that opportunity. And he quotes their poets in the word of God. Now, does that mean everything that poet ever written was inspired by God? No, it doesn't. Same way with Enoch. He's quoting this extra-biblical book here that they would have been commonly, you know, understanding because it was circulated in that day to give an example, all right? And we'll get to that example later. But my point here is that angels, we go off on all of these crazy ideas. These angels, here, here's the thought. Here's the basic thing. If you get off on all that, then you won't get what he's trying to say. What he's trying to say is these angels are charged with leaving their assigned roles or boundaries. God has authority over them, and they overstep their boundaries. God has given them jurisdictions. He's, he's drawn clear lines, and whoever these angels are, they overstep those boundaries. They left their, one version says, abode, abode. They're a signed spot, their jurisdiction. They overstepped the boundary to do what they wanted to do. Therefore, they're fallen angels now. Jude addresses the fact that these false teachers who have crept in among the church are doing the exact same thing. They know the faith that's fixed, and they're crossing the line and perverting the grace. And he tells us why. Because they want to indulge in sensuality. What feels good to me, and therefore, we're under grace. Like, don't let anyone tell you that, that marriage, traditional marriage, only has to be within the bounds of heterosexual, one man, one woman coming together. Don't, don't let them tell you that. You, you don't feel that, do you? You feel something different. Therefore, follow me. This grace is for you. Don't let them people stifle grace. That's what's going on. This example of angels may refer to the rebellion in heaven that Satan led against God in the dawn of human history. It's found in Isaiah 14, 12 through 17. If you want a theology of where we get our doctrine of the devil from, much of it's there. Isaiah 14, 12 through 17. Oh, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star. The King James Version uses the word Lucifer. O oh, Lucifer, son of the dawn, how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. In other words, you deceived the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But... Isaiah says, you are brought down the shoal 
to the far reaches of the pit. Those who see you one day will stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the one who deceived us, who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not let the prisoners go home? That's Isaiah. You could read Ezekiel 28, 12. There's there's some arguing, is this about Satan? But most theologians believe that it refers to Satan in in Ezekiel 28, 12 through 19. You can get the imagery in Revelation 12, 9, where where he he speaks of a red dragon, and his deception was so strong, and the rebellion was so so big that it led as many as one-third of the stars from their abode in heaven. And the stars, again, most people think mean fallen angels. Whether they do or they don't, I'm not here to argue that right now. But apparently Satan and these angels were not content with the holy boundaries that God has, had assigned them. They wanted greater authority and therefore rebelled against God. Or he could be referring to, we studied this back in Genesis, Genesis 6, where the sons of God came down and had relations with the sons of, or the daughters of men. And we, and we could get all wrapped up in that. What was it? And did giants come out of that? And did aliens come out of that? That's where we, there are aliens. Angels cohabitated with, with women. And that's where we get aliens from. Ooh, you know. I'm not willing to go further than what Scripture goes on that. We know that something happened here. Most probably agree that it was really angels and, and there was this cohabitation and what, 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 he, what he bring may, if that's what he's referring to he's telling us again they crossed the boundary God alone is sovereign and lays out the boundaries you are a mere peon and so am I we don't have the right to move God's boundaries We don't have the right to reestablish what God has spoken. And how do we know that? Because objectively, it's in the Word of God. You're not going to get that authoritatively from a dream. You can read it. You don't need a dream. Right there it is. These angels overstepped their boundaries. They rebelled just like the false teachers are rebelling, crossing the boundaries of grace, perverting the grace justifying sensuality, which God condemns. And if you didn't get that, then he gives you one more. That's a historical in uh, in verse 7 here. Look at that. And just as, that just as is important there because he's already established this pattern and he's going to give you something even clearer that everybody would have heard about in Jude's day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities which likewise indulged, crossed the boundary, did what beyond what God said they were, were supposed to do. They indulged. And what did they indulge in? They indulged in sexual immorality. Anything goes. I, I can have relations whenever I want, with whoever I want, however I want, You know, whatever turns me on. I don't care what God says. And even to the pursuit of unnatural desire. Now that that supposes there in God's created order that there is a natural desire. And then there's something unnatural. And and you can probably just look at the anatomy of the human bodies, get you one of those science books and look at, look at the differences and you can figure it out logically. But all logic is thrown out. We're like unreasoning animals, he says, when we go for this stuff and just forsake what God says. We instinctively go for what our deceitful, wicked, sinful heart wants and throw all reason and all logic out the window. So we have this immorality of Sodom in Gomorrah. And what is the point? They got a punishment of eternal fire. You remember the, the pleading before even the angels went in there? The pleading by Abraham. If you find 
If you find some righteous people, will you spare the city? And he starts with a big number, and he whittles it all the way down to, here comes Lot and his family. And Lot, if you want my opinion, is only by covenant that he got out of there. So the issue here with sexual immorality and the pursuit of unnatural desire, which is rebellion against God's clear order God's clear design, God's clear command. And for it, they were destroyed for gross immorality and sensuality. And the things you watch on television when you flip it on for five minutes are just as bad as what he's describing right here. And that's why there's a warning, because we're watching it. And we're getting sucked into it. And, and, and the reality and the heaviness, the heaviness on Jude's heart right now, that God is a God who is holy. He, he's, he's given us these boundaries because he loves us. And if we will function within these boundaries, we will experience great joy, great purpose. We, we will experience what the sovereign maker and creator designed for you. And it will be great and loving and good. God Created man and woman in Genesis. I'm going to be talking about that tonight over in Terra Alta. Genesis 1.27. He created them, and, and after he created them, he says, This is good, man. I'm good. I'm good. Marriage, beautiful. But we're perverting it. There we're perverting it. They were taking the grace of God. And by the way, that means not just the things that we like to point to now, to shroud or to hide our sleeping with our boyfriend or girlfriend on a regular basis. Well, that doesn't seem so bad compared to what's going on now, right? No, this is all of it. This is all of it. So three examples here. Let me give them to you one more time and then we'll quit. Three examples are unbelieving Israel who saw the grace, the power, the mercy of God and yet did not believe. The rebellious angels who crossed the boundaries God clearly laid. And Sodom and Gomorrah who because they crossed the boundaries were indulging in gross sexual immorality and perversion. And because of that, Jude warns, God is going to judge you if you're like this. How could he not? He judged them. So let me end with just a, a beacon of hope here. Here's the good news. Because all of us have crossed God's boundaries, right? Every one of us in here. We could not perfectly keep the law. And the law is good because it shows us how far we fall from God, how far we have fallen. But if you want to continue trying to keep the law in order to have a righteousness to, to see your creator one day, you're doomed. You're doomed. This judgment is going to come upon you. But God sent one, didn't he? A human being. Fully human, fully God, who came and kept every bit of the law perfectly. And he came to die in the place of lawbreakers, grace perverters. He came to die in the place of you. And all he, he asks is that you look upon him and you see that you're a sinner. Turn from your sin and throw all yourself at his mercy. And the act that he did on the cross bearing all the judgment and condemnation for God upon himself so that you won't have to one day. To purchase you. Now that means something. He's purchasing you. You're not yours anymore. We live for him now. And he changes our heart to want to live for him now. The problem with these grace perverters is they snuck in and I don't think they ever really wanted God. And the 
question is, will you believe on him? Will you trust him? Will you receive him? We understand that you can't fix this on your own. It's broken. You're a sinner. Even in your sin, you can't fix it. He fixed it. And, and the reason we, we, we love that he fixed it is because he gets all the glory for that. And that's why every song we sung this morning, every, pray we pray, pray, every prayer we pray, every, every time we open this book, it all points to Jesus. And we that know Jesus rejoice in Jesus. He is our mercy. He is our grace. He is the love of God manifest to us to change us and fill us with his power. So thank you, Lord God, that even though we've read some very bad news here today and it's sobering, we thank you that we have Jesus. Those who will trust, those who will forsake their sin, turn away from it, and put all their hope and all their confidence and all their trust in Jesus can have him. Oh, Lord, make yourself known today, today. And Lord, bring people to yourself, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So as we close out and we sing, again, I want to invite you. There's nothing mystical or magical about coming up to this altar, we call it. But if you would like to, on behalf of your own soul, just pour out your heart to God or, or on behalf of someone you know and you love and they're deceived and, you, and, and, and you, you know, you've talked to them, but you want their heart to belong to Christ. And I want to invite you just to use this. Pray. If you want somebody to pray with you, come, come get one of us. Come grab one of the elders or one of the ladies and pray together today. Judgment is coming, and we don't want to be prideful and arrogant and condemning. We want to have that attitude of concern, consternation, compassion. That's what it says in the end of this book, by the way, anyway. So would you stand as we sing? Yeah.
benediction today comes from 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 through 24. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're dismissed.